Let's start. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could come together on this Sabbath day, this holy day that you have set aside, that you can come and commune with us, Lord, and we ask that you forgive us of our sins, that you would open our minds up to receive your Holy Spirit as we reflect over the history uh, of our people and of the events that have transpired leading up to the to the close of time. I pray that you would uh, guide me and that you would uh, anoint my lips, that you would uh, take my uh, filthiness and my unrighteousness and cover me with uh, your righteousness and that uh, the words of my mouth be from you and not of myself. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start with a quote. This is from the Bible Echo. The Bible Echo, August 26, 1895. The Bible Echo, August 26, 1895. There are periods which are turning points in history of nations and the church. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. If it is received, there is spiritual progress. If it is rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. The Lord in His Word has opened up the aggressive work of the gospel as it has been carried on in the past and will be in the future. Even to the closing conflict, when satanic agencies will make their last wonderful movement, from the word we understand that the forces are now at work that will usher in the last great conflict between good and evil. Satan, the prince of darkness, and Christ, the prince of life. But the coming triumph for the men who love and fear God is as sure as that his throne is established in the heavens. And that's what we're going to focus on. Because what this is talking about, Mrs. White is talking about history. Amen? Amen. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at some turning points. And we're going to start with the time of the end. Okay? And we need to, man, we really need to uh, uh, simplify our message to people. I mean, because we need to take this message to the entire world, right? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Amen. And so let's look at some turning points, and especially turning points with the time of the end. Now, as Seventh as Seventh Day Adventists, we understand that the time of the end began in 1798. 1798. Okay, really quickly, we're going to just look at a couple Bible quotes to illustrate this, okay? All right, turn with me to the book of Daniel. Turn with me to the book of Daniel. And we're going to go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. And the Bible says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times and half a time, and when he shall have accomplished what does that mean to accomplish? To finish. to finish, to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be what? Finished or accomplished. Amen? So there's a time prophecy here. A time, time, and half a time. Okay? Hold, turn with me back to Daniel chapter 7. Because we have this time, time, and half a time, right? Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24. 
And the Bible says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall, do, shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they, who's they? The saints, shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. That's the same period that we just read in Daniel chapter 12. Okay? Now, we identify that this little horn is none other than the papacy. And that time, time, and half a time, we've gone over this before, equals 1260 years. Amen? Which brings you to 1798. In 1798, there's a turning point. Amen? There's a turning point. Okay? And the turning point is both in the history of nations and what? There are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and the church. Amen? So whenever there is a turning point, it involves the church and nations, right? So in 1798, what happens? Well, if you go to Revelation chapter 13, Revelation, the 13th chapter, because this is the stuff we need to be sharing with our friends. Revelation, the 13th chapter. Remember uh, in Daniel chapter 7, they were going to be delivered into his hand for a time, time, and half a time, right? Okay. Daniel chapter 13 and verse 4. Excuse me, Revelation, thank you. Thank you for that. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. Actually, let's look at verse 3. Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. This is again talking about the papacy. Mm -hmm. And they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there were given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, which is exactly what the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 has. Mm -hmm. And power was given unto him to continue for 42 months, which are, again, illustration of 1,260 prophetic years. Again, bringing us down to 1798, right? right? So we're here at 1798 because the Bible says in, in Daniel that this little horn would continue for time, time, and half a time, which is 1260 prophetic years. The book of Revelation 13 says he would continue for 42 months, which is 1260 prophetic years. And when we go all the way back to Daniel chapter 12, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the holy people, it shall be for what? Time, time, and dividing of time, which is 1260 years, which all come to an end at this date right here. Okay? So, what are the turning points that happened? Well, on February 15, 16 of 1798, the papal power was overthrown in Rome. And the first Republic of Italy was set up. Okay? That means that the papacy lost his power. Is that a change in the history of the church? Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. And according to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, when this beast goes down, in, in all the histories, when one beast goes down, another beast comes up. Another beast goes down, another beast comes up. If you look at this chart right here, where it says Papal Rome, Papal Rome goes down in power in 1798, and another beast comes up out of the earth, which is represented by this beast in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And so in 1798, what beast is it that's coming up out of the earth? It's the United States of America. It's the United States of America. Amen? Amen. 
So it's around this time in 1798 that the United States of America starts to be recognized as a power. You see, up until this point, the United States was looked at as a, a colony of Great Britain that was in rebellion, okay? And we had a war over it, but the war wasn't finished. Do you, who can tell me why that war, uh, why, why the most powerful army in the world at the time, England, didn't mop the road with us? <laughs> why, why was it that Great Britain didn't destroy the American Continental Armies? You got it. He nailed it on the head. You see, France, that other beast, amen? The beast from the abyss, the beast of atheism, the king of the south, they were arch rivals. France and England were arch rivals, and, and England could not commit all of its military might against the American colonies as long as its arch enemy, France, was in the field. Isn't that true? And so what happens is, after 1798, France and England enter into a series of wars. Everybody remember these? They're called the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is there a reason that you didn't get Revelation 12, 14, Revelation 11, 3, and Revelation 12, 6 along with these? Yeah, because I was only given a couple of verses. Oh, okay. Overview. Yeah, just, just an overview. Okay. But yeah, that's good. Thank you. So, um, so what happens is, in these Napoleonic Wars, France and England are battling back and forth, and finally, who's defeated? Napoleon. Amen? Napoleon is defeated, and France is no longer the power that it was. So what happens is, England says, okay, now our hands are free, and we're going to go back, and we're going to take our what? We're going to take our possession, right? How many people here remember what happened in the Falkland Wars? The Falkland War? You guys remember that? The Falkland Islands? Yeah. Remember that? Was it 1981? I think it was, where Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands because they said, hey, that's part of Argentina. Mm -hmm. And England was like, no, that's not. And so the prime minister, remember the iron prime minister, what was her name? Margaret Thatcher? dispatched an expeditionary force to expel the Argentines from the Falklands. Why do you think she did that? Well, because, she, well, well, what happens is when a country owns a possession, if you start allowing possessions to either free themselves or become liberated by other countries, then one of your possessions would fall after another, right? And so when Great Britain, remember, uh, there was the old saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire, right? Mm -hmm. so, so England had this vast, uh, um, expansive colonial empire that literally stretched around the world. Mm -hmm. And if the United States was allowed to stand, then everybody else would start getting the idea that they could be independent too. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, Shortly after they defeat Napoleon, France, I mean, uh, England sends an army over to the United States and it starts a war called the War of 1812. You guys familiar with this? I want to tell you something though right here. Before the War of 1812 starts, the United States had, a, had another war before that. Did you know that? Excuse me? Well, there, there was some wars with some Indians, okay? But there was another war with another power. And it was the first war that the United States entered into, and it's even in a song. American Revolution? No, no. How many people remember the uh, theme song to the, uh, the Marine Corps theme song? From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of what? Tripoli. Tripoli. What is that? What's the shores of Tripoli? Africa. It's in North Africa, right? 
Well, here's what happened. The United States, as long as it was allied with England before the Revolutionary War, British ships of war, British man, man of war ships, battleships, uh, patrolled the Mediterranean and they protected uh, American commerce from being attacked by Islamic raiders. Okay? But as soon as the United States and Great Britain separated, right, then we didn't have that protection. And so over a period of time, these Islamic militant raiding ships would assault American commerce and it would take our supplies and hostages. Does this sound familiar? And then what they would do is they would ransom them back to the United States. And it was at this time that the President of the United States, who was a guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, came up with a policy that we're not going to negotiate with terrorists. Okay? And so what the United States of America did is it, it made a squadron of ships loaded these ships full of Marines, and even at the very early stage of this nation, we sent this squadron of ships over to the Mediterranean, and we invaded Tripoli. The Marines landed at Tripoli, and we had victory over Islam. Can you imagine that? Isn't that amazing? that after our independence, the first war that we get into is with Islam, okay? After we're successful in the war with Islam, the British come back, re-invade the United States of America, they uh, came to Washington, D.C., they burned the White House, they set fire to the Capitol building, and you guys have probably heard the stories about the mysterious rain cloud. As the Capitol building was burning, the rain cloud came over from nowhere and put out the fire. Amazing thing, right? But what happens is that this war continues until the British are like, enough's enough. We're going to go ahead and put an end to the whole war. We're going to, we're going to land a, 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 a three-part invasion strategy of the United States, and they set uh, to invade the United States from the east and from the south and from the north. And this is going to put an end to the war. And the culmination of this whole thing, the, the two invasion port places from the east and from the south are diversionary. The main body of British forces are going to pour through Canada into the United States, and the day that that was set for was September 11th, 1814. September 11th, 1814. Now, at this day right here, on September 11th, 1814, the British Empire, fresh from its defeat of Napoleon, would be considered the greatest military force in the, in the world. But on September 11th, 1814, the United States of America defeated England. And I have to ask you a question. If this country defeats this country and becomes a world ruler, and so on and so forth, when the England, let, let me put things in pr perspective. The papacy was overthrown in February of 1798 by who? By France. England then defeated France. Do you see how this goes? So if France is the most powerful, and by the way, did you know that initially England couldn't take France by themselves? They had to form an alliance with Prussia and Russia, right? They couldn't take them by themselves. And Napoleon, he was the dude, right? So. But, but when, when England finally defeats Napoleon, it becomes the lone superpower, right? right? So France is defeated by England, and then England comes as the sole superpower, and on September 11th, 1814, they are in turn defeated by the United States of America, which makes the United States of America a what? 
undisputed. Pretty simple. These are turning points, right? Turning points in the history of nations and the church. Turning points of the nation of France in 1798. Turning points in the history of the papacy, 1798. Turning points in the history of America, 1798. Turning points in the history of England, September 11, 1814. Turning point in the history of the United States, September 11, 1814. And September 11th is the turning point within Adventism. And I'm going to go on the record, and some may dispute this, and I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. Adventism began on September 11th, 1814, in my opinion. Because who was there? William Miller. William Miller. Amen. <coughs> William Miller. We have an exciting message. Amen. William Miller was there, a deist, and when that bomb exploded two feet away from him, he became converted that there was a power that loved and cared for him. Now, it was a process that took time. Right? It didn't happen overnight, but he recognized right there that there was a God that cared for him, that loved him, and looked out for his best interest. And not only did he say on that day that there was a power that looked out for him, but that power looked out for the United States of America. Amen? Amen. Because that country, and this is when it was coming up, was a lamb-like power. Amen? Amen? Yes, yes, the United States of America, just like the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, has always had shortcomings. Isn't that true? That's true? It has always had shortcomings. But if you look at the progress of things in the United States of America, especially in the northern part of the United States of America, there was a godly people. Amen? the north part of America. And I'm talking about in 1814. These people were Bible students. They were against the use of alcohol. They were against the use of slavery. They were against gambling. You understand what I'm saying? God had a people and the land that he gave them was the United States of America that's illustrated in Revelation chapter 12. Amen? The woman fled into the wilderness. Amen. And the earth did what? Help the woman. And that beast comes up out of where? The earth. Right? This is the United States of America. This is where the church begins. This is where I believe Adventism. Now, one could make an argument, well, Adventism goes all the way back to the Reformation or whatever. I'm talking about Millerite Adventism. Amen. The understanding that the book of Daniel is what? Unsealed. We can understand it, right? This is turning point here. Now, let's look at the turning point in our time, okay? I don't know if you can really understand this, but maybe I should, I'm just going to roll with it as it is, right? So we have here 1798 is a turning point. We have here that the September 11th, 1814 is a turning point, okay? okay. Now, what was it that happened in 1798? The papacy received a deadly wound, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now let's fast forward to our time, okay? Let's fast forward to our time. Why should Seventh-day Adventists today literally be on the edge of their seats, literally be motivated like no other people in, on the whole planet right now? Because the deadly wound is healed. Look at Revelation chapter 13, look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. Revelation 13, verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by, the, by a sword and did what? Live. So if you look at this chart over here, right here, you see it says papal Rome, an image to what? The papacy. 
It doesn't say image to the beast, it says image to the papacy. Why? Because the papacy has already been identified as the beast. So when this country should make an image to the papacy, then we have a problem, right? So this nation was started out as a Protestant and what? Re a Republican and Protestant nation, right? A lamb-like power, right? But it would eventually start speaking like a dragon. So we're really asleep as Seventh-day Adventists. Do you know that? Amen. Do you know if we go back to the year 1982, in the year 1982, that Pope... John Paul II and Ronald Wilson Reagan had their first physical meeting, okay? The United States President Ronald Reagan got on Air Force One and flew to Rome, and he met with the Pope in the Vatican Library, and when they met, Reagan was taking the, um, what's a good word for it? Uh... In other words, he, he was humbling himself before the Pope. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mean to wear, a black wore the black. You guys understand that, that when you have an audience with the Pope, the Pope wears black white. and well, white, excuse me, and out of respect to the papacy in his office, you wear black. Right. It's a protocol. And Reagan followed this protocol, which means you're acting in a subservient position. Amen? Yep. Number two, if you are a world ruler, right? Let me ask you a question. Um, let's say that for some reason you and the Queen of England entered into some dialogue. You, you were on Facebook or some kind of internet chat thing and, and lo and behold the Queen of England was on there. Okay? And uh, she said, uh, you, you started communicating with each other because you had something in common. And one day the queen said, hey, I have an idea. We should meet. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think it would be likely that the Queen of England would come to Bonners Ferry, Idaho, or that you would go to Buckingham Palace? Yeah, come up there. <laughs> You're going to Buckingham Palace, right? Yeah. Okay. So did you know that Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan had an event that transpired that led to them to start communicating? And what was it? Well, the event was that Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II had assassinations attempt and were shot six weeks apart in 1981, the year before the meeting. There are turning points in the history of what? Nations, Nations and the church. And, the, and, and Ellen White says it's in, it's in these different crises. Brothers and sisters, was it a crisis in the Roman Catholic Church when the Pope was shot? Mm -hmm. yep. Was it a crisis in the United States of America when Ronald Reagan was shot? Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a crisis. So whenever there's a crisis, there's a turning point, right? That happened in 1981, right? Brothers and sisters, was there a crisis going on in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1981? Anybody remember a guy by the name of Desmond Ford? Glacier View took place in 1981. It was a crisis in the Seventh-day Adventist Church because we were trying to defend, we were trying to defend our belief in the heavenly sanctuary in 1844 using a faulty methodology of higher criticism. You understand what I'm saying? And it's during this time right here in 1981 that a plethora of Seventh-day Adventist ministers left the denomination. 1981. It started in the 70s, of course, but 1981, it moves forward. Uh, here's the actual dates for, for the meeting. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Sanctuary Review Committee was a group of biblical scholars. The meeting was held from the 11th to the 15th of August, 1980, at Glacier View Ranch, a church-owned camp. 
Okay? So this meeting was held, but the fallout continued. The church was in crisis. Okay? In 1981, the Seventh-day Adventist church was in crisis. Amen? It's also right about this time in the early 1980s that celebrationism started coming into the Adventist church. Okay? Now, so here's what happens. In 1982, the Pope of Rome and Ronald Reagan meet. Now, that really should have started sending flares up right? Mm, sure. Like warning signs? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm not old enough to remember when John Kennedy was elected president, but there was a lot of concern that people had that, that he was going to follow the orders from the Pope, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Sure. But by, and that was in 1960, right? But, so by 1982, the, the President of the United States and the Pope are getting real friendly and it's not sending up any signals in Adventism? Yeah. Something's wrong with that. Something is definitely wrong with that. Why? Because history is actually moving forward and the Seventh-day Adventist Church is struggling internally. We're not actually understanding that history is being fulfilled. Right? Okay. So here's the thing. So in 1982, this, what would later be called in Time Magazine, the Holy Alliance is formed. Amen? Yeah, and what actually ends up happening is that, and again, for all those that haven't read that magazine article, uh, Time Magazine, 1982, title, Holy Alliance. Uh, Carl Bernstein of Woodward and Bernstein fame. You know, remember the guys that broke the Watergate scandal in the 1970s? Carl Bernstein wrote this article, and he lines out a step-by-step -step process of how Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II formed an alliance that brought down the Soviet Union. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at this little chart over here, it says the two lamb-like horns, Republican and Protestantism, whose names number 666 became united in action, speak like a dragon. So the thing is that the United States of America reached out her hand across the Gulf and grasped the hand of the papal power. At the same time in 1982 that's doing this, in 1981, when Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II were shot, they both entered into an experience that led them to be controlled by spiritualism. Amen. You see, when, Re when, when Pope John Paul II was laying in the hospital bed, he had a visitor, the Lady of Fatima. The Lady of Fatima. And for all you that, that may not under have heard this, the Lady of Fatima visited some children in 1917 and gave them a series of, I believe, three prophecies. Okay? Now, what's interesting about the year 1917? Well, that's when the Bolshevik Revolution took over Russia and they became communist. Okay? And so what happens is Pope John Paul II has this visitor to his room as he's laying on his deathbed with his deadly wound, and this visitor gives him a mission. And the mission is to fulfill the prophecy that was given back in 1917 to bring Russia back into the church. You understand what I'm saying? That's when Stalin told the Pope, you don't have an army, what are you going to do? Right. And the, the basically the Pope says, I'll have my army. It won't be too far down the line, but maybe not right now. And the army would be the United States of America under Ronald Reagan. So from this point on, Pope John Paul II, being guided by his message from a spirit, mm -hmm. enters and, or endeavors to collapse the Soviet Union. But he can't do it alone. While Reagan is on his deathbed, Recovering from his deadly wound, Nancy Reagan, an avowed spiritualist, 
now becomes afraid for her husband. She's afraid and fearful that everywhere that he's going to go, people are going to want to kill him, right? She becomes really paranoid. And so she wants to take things into her own hands. And from this point until the end of his presidency and maybe even beyond, every single move, every single decision, every single meeting, every single travel engagement, every single destination, and the dates and days and times for those meetings and destinations are given to Nancy Reagan through a spirit medium. Now, what was her name? It was somebody else, but it's akin to that, an astrologer. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Let's look at the vision that Ellen White has. When this nation shall reach her hand across the gulf and grasp the hand of spiritualism, I mean, uh, the papacy. Did that happen in 82? When we shall reach our hand across the abyss and grasp the hand of spiritualism, did that happen in 1982? It did. It's a turning point. If he was fearful for his life, he said, no, he wasn't, because he understood that he was meant to accomplish something yeah. um, in the world. I mean, he knew... Him and the Pope were both destined to do that. Yes, they were. he knew he was destined to do something. Right. And he didn't know why at that point, but... Amen. So, what ends up happening here is that this event continues... And in the year 1989, the, uh, the, uh, the first fruits of the Holy Alliance between Pope John Paul and Ronald Reagan, the first fruits become harvested. And that is when the Berlin Wall falls. Now, the Soviet Empire didn't collapse in 1989. That wouldn't happen until 1992. But nonetheless, the first fruits of their uh, evil harvest became uh, apparent in 1989. Um, now, I understand that the Soviet Union was an evil empire. But remember, Reagan called it an evil empire himself. But where, it's, where this fruit is evil is that the United States of America entered into a church-state relationship with the papacy. Amen? Amen? When, 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 when the knowledge of all the details are revealed to the entire world, when they're revealed to the entire world, do evangelical Protestant Americans, do they scorn the events of what happened during the Reagan years, or do they praise it? They praise it. In other words, what they're saying is Ronald Reagan did a good thing by entering into a league with a church-state relationship. Do you see that? That completely nullifies everything that we stand for as both a Protestant and Republican nation. It goes against Protestantism because we identify that the papacy is the man of sin. We're protesting Rome. So when you enter into league with Rome... You're revoking your Protestantism. Right. Amen. Amen? It revokes Republicanism because the whole idea of Republicanism is that there is a wall of separation between church and state. Amen? Amen? And so when you enter into a relationship politically with a church and you give your power and your might and your authority and your finances and your money and your military secrets over to a church... You have just violated the principles of what? Church and state. Amen. Amen? Amen? So what happens in 1992 is all this becomes revealed, and instead of, uh, instead of Seventh-day Adventists standing up and saying, Whoa, yeah. what is going on here? Instead of doing that, we're asleep. They're always still battling with Desmond Ford. 
We're asleep. We're fighting celebrationism and we're fighting new theology and Desmond Fordism and all these other things that are pouring in when we should be going to the whole world and saying, hey, the deadly wound is healing. The Sunday law is coming. We've revoked our uh, uh, standards as a Republican and Protestant nation. And instead, people are saying, oh man, Re we need another president like Reagan. <laughs> right? We need another president like Reagan. So what happens here? That's a turning point. A turning point. That brings us to September 11th, 2001. September 11th, 2001. Now let me read this quote again. There are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and of the church. In the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. 2001, September 11th, no one in this room, and I dare, say, I dare say no one in the world, could argue that one of the greatest crises that ever arrived in modern American history is that on 9-11-2001, the United States was attacked, just like it was on 9-11-1814, but this time things were different. This time things were different. Because when this attack arrived at the end of the world, remember what happens here? Deadly wound, attack on 9-11. Deadly wound given, attack on 9-11. Deadly wound healed, attack on 9-11. Are you seeing this stuff? But when the attack on 9-11 comes here, it finds a different nation. It finds a nation in rebellion. It finds a nation that has already embraced the papacy. It finds a nation that has rejected its Republican and its Protestant values. It finds a nation that is steeped in sin and homosexuality and every type of spiritualism that you can come up with. And so what happens here instead of an event that leads people to God. By the way, did you know that this event right here led people to God? It did. When, when the main generals that were in charge of the battle arrived in Washington, D.C. to uh, receive their awards and went before Congress and the president, you know what they all unanimously said? It's impossible that we could have won. The Americans were outnumbered three to one. Three to one. And when the British launched a combined air and a, a, a land and sea attack on the United States of America, and the United States of America is outnumbered three to one, and not only are they outnumbered three to one, they're outnumbered three to one against the best trained, best equipped military force in the entire world, just fresh off their victories over Napoleon. Okay? And the leaders say, it's impossible that we could have won but for God. God performed a miracle. And they all said this. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. God saved the United States. Go into the history books. A friend of mine just bought a history book on this battle right here, the Battle of Plattsburgh, September 11th, 1814. And the testimony of those that were there is again and again and again miraculous. That's the word that was used. This was miraculous. And do you know that this battle right here on September 11th, 1814, most historians that know anything about it will tell you that that's the most important day and battle in all of American history, that day. You know why? Because the only thing that stood between us speaking more with an English accent today is that battle. If the British had have broken through Plattsburgh, they would have poured down into the United States and that would have been it. It would have been all over. That day and that battle is arguably the most important event in early American history. And those that were involved in an event said it was a miracle from God that they were delivered out of the hand of their enemies. But here in September 11th, 2001, 
America is found to be a different nation, a nation that has repudiated its principles as a Protestant and Republican nation and has grasped hands with the papal power and even the Seventh-day Adventist Church is asleep to the fact of our true condition. The events that should have been heralding, the events that should have woken up Adventism as to what was transpiring in the world has found us dead asleep. Yes? Interesting, if you read the next sentence in the book, Mel and White, it brings us out. You want to read it? It says, the light to that time is given. When these different crises arrive, if it's received, there is spiritual progress. If it's rejected, spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. Amen. And so, that's what's going on. That's what has gone on. Now, friends, with a spiritual formation. Spiritual formation came in and accepted it. Ste September 11th, 2001, the church voted uh, at, a, at a meeting to accept uh, the teaching and guidelines of spiritual formation. I believe, uh, I can't remember all the specifics, but I believe it was a, a mandate that all uh, 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 theolo theology students receive a training in spiritual formation. Okay? Now, which is, by the way, a, a, a teaching that originates with none other than Ignatius Loyola, mm -hmm. who, as many of you may know, is the originator of the Jesuit movement. Yeah. Amen? Okay. Now, we're looking into the future, right? We, we, we've just reviewed some of the turning points of the past. I mean, you, you know, really, even without the light that the Lord has been pouring in the last few years, even without that light, every Seventh-day Adventist should, should be understanding right now that when the United States and, and, and the papacy overthrew the Soviet Union, that not only was that a fulfillment of prophecy, but it was a turning point in where the United States was heading. Amen. I mean, we're, we're literally at the Sunday Law. You guys understand that? Yes. But so let's, let's look at this, okay? I'm going to read this again. There are periods which are turning points in the history of nations and of the church. In the providence of God, these different crises arrive. The light for that time is given. Now, it's not often that we can see a crisis before it arrives. Now, you do understand that on 9-11-2001, there were people that were pretty smart that were saying, we're going to be tacked. And there, there was a guy in particular who was at the World Trade Center, and he was the head of security, and he goes, this place is going to be attacked again. You understand that? There was people that not only knew we were going to be attacked, they knew that at some point in the future that Islam planned on flying planes into buildings. They could see the crisis. Have you guys seen, uh, there's a, a, a documentary that's been made that there was, a, there was actually a war games going on on 9-11-2001. And in the war games that were going on, they were simulating that terrorists had hijacked planes and were flying them into buildings. I mean, you can't get any more crazy, right? So here's the thing. Like I said, there isn't many times in history when you can actually see the crisis ahead of time, except there are individuals that can see with 2020 the events that are coming at us, right? Okay. There's a turning point. Absolutely. 
The Seventh-day Adventist church is in a crisis. And that crisis is going to come head to head in a battle at the general conference meeting in July of 2015. It's going to be an event that has the potential of literally just ripping the church completely apart. It's already begun. And this is one of the ways that we can see that there's a there's a battle going on now, but there's a war in the future. Right. Amen? Amen? Brothers and sisters, since in, in, the, in the over 150-year history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is there any crisis that has come in that has been so divisive that it threatens to rip the entire church apart? If there is, I've never seen it. You see, there's been issues... You know, Desmond Ford. But Desmond Ford, Kellogg, did not divide every single member. You understand what I'm saying? This, everybody, it's so simple of an issue that, and so divisive that everybody has an opinion. Isn't that true? So what's going to happen here, we don't exactly know. But we do know this. There are turning points in history of nations in the church, in the providence of God, when these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given. Which tells us that the light for this time is being, going to be given before, during, or after this event right here because it's in these crises that the light for that time arrives. What is that light going to be? And what are we going to do to embrace that light and to take that light to the entire world? Was there a light that came on September 11, 2001? If you believe Ellen White, there was. Amen. So what happens here is that are we going to accept the light that's going to come? Are we going to accept the light that is coming? And if the, and if the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't accept it, if it's received, there's spiritual progress. If it's rejected, there's spiritual declension and shipwreck follow. What are we going to do? Let's go back in our minds to 1844 after the Great Disappointment. A 17-year-old girl. Do 17-year-old do, do girls today wield much power? How about a 21-year-old? A 21-year-old young man who had been cross-eyed most of his life. James White. So you got a 17-year-old girl, a 21-year-old young man, Another 21-year-old young man, and the oldest of the group, they called him the old man, 38 years old, Joseph Bates. They changed the world. And, and there were less of them than there is in this room right here. They received the light for that time. You see, when the midnight cry went out, and they believed that Jesus was coming, he was coming, but he wasn't coming to this earth. He was coming to the most holy place. Amen? And when, ha and when Hiram Edson saw that that happened and shared with the people the sanctuary message and they accepted the light for that time, they changed the world. But the light for that time came back in, in 1888. I left that out here. But in 1888, this general conference of Seventh-day Adventists rejected the light. They rejected the third angel's message in verity, righteousness by faith. And so that generation had to die in the wilderness. Their carcasses had to be laid to sleep so that another generation at the end of the world would come. And now the Lord is coming back with a message. And by the way, Ellen White says, we have no new message. So if she says, we have no new message... And then she says, a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. 
It's the old message. Zerubbabel has laid the foundation, and Zerubbabel will finish the work. Amen? Amen. So, whatever this light is, it has to do with the original message that God gave to his people. The first, second, and third angel's message. Amen. The message that we have to take to the entire world. And the question I have for you today is, do you want to be bearers of that light? And if you do, I mean, <laughs> Ellen White says there is to be a manifestation of the power of God that's going to out-exceed the manifestation that took place in 1844 by tenfold. Tenfold. What if you had, what if you were living in the time of Christ, and after his ascension, you had a detailed, in-depth understanding that on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit was going to descend on His people as long as you had completely what? Completely surrendered to Christ and that you were in unity and with one accord with the brothers and sisters. Right? When that happened, the Holy Spirit descended. Amen? Amen. What if you had an inside information that that was going to happen. Would you be preparing yourself? Right? Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, I'm giving you some insight. If you believe that Mrs. White, what she's saying is right, when she says that in these different crises arrive, the light for that time is given, then the light for that time is going to be given. And we have the opportunity right now to submit ourselves to the will of Christ, to confess our sins and to flee from sin so that when this period comes here in the not-too-distant future, and, and, and I don't know if, if, you know, sometimes a message starts out slowly and, 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 and crescendos, right? I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know if it's going to be a small manifestation, but I do know this. That Ellen White says, the latter rain will be falling on hearts all around. But those that haven't submitted themselves by confession and repentance will not even know it. So even if it does happen, if we don't take steps today, right now, to submit ourselves to the will of God in everything that we do, in every aspect of our lives, that when the message does come, and when the Holy Spirit is poured on God's people, we won't even know it or discern it. Isn't that amazing? Turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. The Bible tells us what has already happened and what's going to happen. Amen? How am I doing? 56? Okay. I'm going to wind it up right here. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Pentecost meaning 50. Amen? Amen. 50 days after what? 50 days after Passover. Okay? So, this goes all the way back to the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt, right? 50 days after Passover, Pentecost was fully come. They were with all, one accord. Brothers and sisters, are we of one accord? I don't think so. We have to get with one accord. We have to know what we believe, and we have to be standing on a sure foundation. Amen? Amen. They were with, all, with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came the sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. Amen? And it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. We talked about this last night when the fire comes down, right? A sign of the Holy Spirit. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? This is what's going to happen again. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. 
Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were what? Confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galatians? Galileans, sorry. And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? And I'm not going to read all those. Are Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, and dwellers in Mesopotamia, and Judea, and uh, Cappadon Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, uh, Phry Phrygia, and uh, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and uh, parts of Libya, and uh, Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. Cretes and who? Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in what? Doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Brothers and sisters, you don't want to be in the position when this message goes out that you're sitting there saying, what does this mean? It's coming. It's coming. Look at verse 17. Oh, well, uh, let me keep reading. And what, what happens in verse 13? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. You're, you're, you're out of the way. Verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. That's powerful words. Mm -hmm. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my advice to each one of us here today is that we should call on the name of the Lord Amen. for understanding, to prepare ourselves for the events that are surely about to take place. Like I said, I don't know exactly what is going to happen. I can have an educated guess. I can look at how things happened in the past and say, well, if it could happen like this, it could happen like this. But you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that when you go back and you look at the uh, stories of the apostles, everybody that had a preconceived thought of what was going to happen, it usually ended up being something different. Isn't that true? Yeah. So we know that something's going to happen. We know a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. But we're also told that the means that God is going to use are going to be very simple. That he's going to appear as if he takes the reins in his own hands. And he's going to work out of the normal order of things. It's going to be totally different. And one of the reasons why it's going to be rejected by most Seventh-day Adventists is because when this event or these events that are taking place and continue to take place, people will look at them and because the events don't meet their preconceived ideals or opinions, they will reject the light. Yes. out of their mind because they've got to do this on a one-to-one -one basis with God. There's not going to be any, I mean, a group setting, but it's going to be on your knees 
and point you to God to know what is. Amen. Daniel 12:10 will tell you what what God will Let's do. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 10. This is the experience. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 10. A threefold testing message here. And the Bible says, Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And what is it that makes you wise? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're told by your prophet, the only thing that we have to fear for the future is, is as we forget the past and your teaching in our past history. Lord, um, we're told by the prophet that we have no new message, that a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. We, we are shown in the spirit of prophecy that there's a threefold testing message, first, second, and third angel's message. Let us be about a personal work to turn from sin and sinning in our own lives that we would come together and know the doctrines that we advocate, that we would press together around the teachings of the first, second, and third angel's message, that we would know not only what they mean, but how to illustrate them, how to give those messages so that when the great test comes that we won't be ashamed of what we believe and that we would press together as a people and be in one accord so on that day the Holy Spirit would fall out upon us and we would not be among those who were astonished and in doubt as to what was taking on. We don't want to be in a condition, Lord, that when the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure that we don't even know or discern that it's even happening. Forgive us, O Lord, of the time that we have wasted of the time that we have squandered, the precious time. And Lord, help us to uh, do a work, a personal work, and a global work to prepare for your soon coming. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.